Look, I know everybody's all excited for stuff that AMD has. I am too. But this, uh, this is the 10940X. I had one of my robots on alert to try to purchase this online for like a month. And I only just succeeded. February, that's like a month and a half after this CPU was actually released. There's the 10980 coming in at under $1,000. The retail price on this one's $800, but you can get it a little less at Micro Center. But the price is maybe a little bit artificially inflated because these are hard to get. So uh, my goal is to actually look at, you know, sort of Intel's pricing and also show off the, the new Asus X299 motherboards. Whether you like it or not, I mean, X299, this is basically the third generation of CPUs that will go in this socket. There's a lot of lessons learned there. There's a lot of stability there. And uh, basically the clocks out of the box with the, uh, you know, 10940, it's about as good as you can achieve with, you know, an overclock from like the seven or 8,000 series or seven or 9,000 series for this CPU. Although in general with the availability of these CPUs, I'm a little worried about, you know, companies like Asus, like their ability to sell boards. Is Asus's 30th birthday. Well, not really, but this is their 30 year anniversary. I mean, so I guess it's kind of a birthday. I'm not really sure. They did this super attractive X299 board for their 30th anniversary. Look at that. It's the, it's the 30th anniversary version of the Prime. And this is a solid motherboard. X299 is uh, very feature rich. You have a lot of options. It's very solid. It's very well supported in Linux. It's a very solid Windows workstation. Uh, you are paying a little bit of the Intel tax, given the, uh, the the current state of the market and competition, but there are certain things that Intel CPUs still do really well. You may have an application that's optimized specifically for an Intel CPU and want to be able to run an Intel CPU. Curiously, some web-based tasks, like if you look at Chrome automation benchmarks, Intel CPUs perform really well, or AMD CPUs perform perhaps not as well as you'd expect. But if you just use the system and you're using those types of applications, it seems reasonably responsive. So I'm not really sure what to make of that. But overall, you know, with, with, with the 10980XE, it's about, it's an 18 core processor. It's about $1,000, give or take, which is about half of what an 18 core processor would cost in the previous iteration. Similarly, the 14 core, the 14 core would previously set you back a lot more than seven to eight hundred dollars. I think um, I think the determination, though, in running some benchmarks and running some testing on the 10980XE, I think that uh, the pricing would still have to come down a few hundred dollars to be competitive, unless you specifically need things in this feature set. Now, one thing that's uh, one other thing that's weird in the competitive landscape is that there's this gap. So, like from $750 for the 3950X on the AMD side to $1,400 for Threadripper. Now you could buy a previous generation AMD product, like second gen Threadripper, but if it was a choice of second gen Threadripper and X299, that's a lot tougher choice than third generation Threadripper, which is gonna be faster, single core and multi-core for most things, not everything. Uh, and then we've got this platform. Now, another thing that's weird is that, uh, Intel initially allowed uh, LR DIMMs and uh, registered DIMMs to work on the X299 platform, and then it didn't. Like, they turned it off with a BIOS update. So, whoops, I had a 7980XE, it's like, oh, 384 gigs of RAM, no problem. And then they turned it back on again, but it's not officially supported. So, your mileage may vary. Depends on the board, depends on some other factors. But you may be able to get away with registered DIMMs. That's something we'll have to test. So the X299 Prime 30th Anniversary Edition. And of course, if the 30th Anniversary Edition is not available, well, we also have the misprint edition. So the handles, the handles on top. I think, I think that was accidental. There we go. Same board features and layout as the not 30th edition, but it's got a little bit different visual aesthetic. And this is the system we're gonna put it in. Officially, both of these boards will support 256 gigabytes of memory. It's a quad channel configuration, eight DIMMs, maximum 4266. 
You have two M.2, that's socket three with the M type key, so that's uh, 2242, 2260, 2280, and 22110, so you can use the 110 millimeter. It's PCI 3.0 by four, and then we've got one M.2 socket three that'll also run at 22 by 10, but that is both SATA and PCI Express by three. We also have eight SATA six gigabit per second ports. It's got the Aquantia five gigabit LAN and an Intel i219V, ASUS LAN guard, and the ASUS Turbo LAN utility. It's got the Intel Wi-Fi 6 AX200, which is a 2x2 MIMO ABGNACAX with Bluetooth 5.0. One big upgrade with the 10th gen CPUs is they use some of the previously unused pins to enable more PCIe lanes. So 44 PCI Express lanes from the CPU. Yes, finally. Oh, I can run my M.2 storage. The PCIe layout on this board, even though it is 44 PCI Express lanes, a lot of those go to the M.2, but we've got three by 16 slots and two by one slots. I would have liked to have seen a by four slot for things like a capture card, but you could run dual GPU and a capture card or a single GPU and dual capture card. Not really a problem on this motherboard. Now for the love of all that is holy, don't buy one of the older CPUs that's only 28 PCIe lanes because uh, effectively the bottom slot becomes a by two slot and it's just, it's not a good situation. The newer CPUs that are 44 lanes, so that's like 18 core, 12 core, 10 core CPUs, 14 core CPUs. You get three PCI, the three slots will run at uh, X16 and then X16, X16, and then X16, X16, X8, which is awesome. Both of these also have onboard Thunderbolt. Yep, you got two 40 gigabit per second onboard Thunderbolt ports. If you're planning to overclock, the VRM solution does have a built-in cooling fan that'll kick on if cooling is needed around the VRM area. At the rear I.O. we have our one gigabit Intel i219V NIC, our Aquantia five gig NIC, USB 2.0 ports, two USB three ports. Then we've got our dual full-size DisplayPort inputs. Those will go out from your graphics card and in to the back of the motherboard for the Thunderbolt controller that's on board. So you can do, you know, USB-C. If you got the fancy LG USB-C display or Thunderbolt display, that'll plug right in and then your display will just go through the one tiny little USB-C cable. Then we've got two more 10 gigabit USB ports and then Thunderbolt ports right below that, our Wi-Fi solution, and then of course our optical SPDIF port and our five analog ports that go with our, our S1220A audio solution. Now, even though these two boards are super, super similar, the 30th anniversary edition has better overclocking capabilities because it's got more VRM heat sink goodness and they sort of moved around the power plugs a little bit. So if you want a little bit more overclocking headroom, you can go with the Prime. I'm gonna save this one for the 18 core. Assuming that I can find another 18 core on sale for less than MSRP or about MSRP. I'm gonna go with the regular, not 30th edition, X299 Prime. It's moving! Yes. 14 cores, what's the verdict on the price? $800 is still too much, I think. <laughs> Intel has always historically been very careful. Like the 9900K is king of the hill in terms of you know, propane and propane, except no. It's king of the hill in terms of single thread performance. And Intel's always been very careful to make sure that the single thread performance is far and away better on their, their desktop class CPUs than their high-end desktop CPUs. And that's kind of come back to haunt them here a little bit because this platform costs less now than third gen Threadripper. And so the third gen Threadripper CPUs start at 24 cores. And that 24 core Threadripper CPU is gonna beat the crap out of this CPU for both single thread and multi-thread and PCIe bandwidth and memory bandwidth and basically any kind of measurement you wanna throw at it unless there are some edge cases for applications that are specifically optimized for the Intel platform. Uh, the memory latency is a little higher on the Threadripper platform, but the giant gargantuan amounts of cash on the Threadripper platform effectively hide that. So there are some applications that are still sensitive to some of those latencies, and so in those edge cases, okay, maybe. But it's actually really, it's really, it's really pretty incredible what AMD's done in terms of the competitive landscape. That said, this is less expensive than Threadripper, so it's kind of comparable to Threadripper, but it's kind of not. I mean, the way that Intel's done the pricing. So overall, the verdict here, this, this motherboard is within margin of error of other X299 motherboards. It doesn't perform significantly better or significantly worse. The ASUS overclocking options can get you to spinning distance of five gigahertz. 4.8 gigahertz was stable for me on this Corsair, you know, all-in-one H115i, not the platinum, it's like the older version. This whole platform is in kind of a weird position overall. 
But if you're looking for the X299 platform, this board's pretty solid. I would have liked to have seen the X4 slot, like I mentioned before, but it's pretty solid. The Linux experience is great. The onboard LED screen to tell you exactly why it won't post is perhaps handy. Uh, the 30th, I would probably pick the 30th anniversary edition over this one just because of the beefed up VRMs and the overclocking. That said, but with the airflow in this case, I had no problems. I think if you're gonna pick something on the X299 platform, my recommendation would, would be to go to spend the extra 200 bucks and get the 18 core. There's not enough, uh, you can get single, uh, single core overclocks a little higher with the 14 core, probably owing to the fact that it's four less cores. But I think the $200 price delta, you should, I mean, especially when you factor in the cost of the overall system, just go for the 18 core. Uh, if you're looking, if you've already got an X299 motherboard and you're looking at like the 14 core upgrade, seven, $800, it's not terrible. It's not the deal of the century though, when you take into account the entire competitive landscape. And that's, you know, competition's good for consumers. And this is X299 and it's solid and mature and all that kind of stuff. I'm Wendell, this is level one. Oh, and our Linux testing. Linux, Linux testing, of course, went really well. The IOMMU groups are solid. There's good separation of the onboard peripherals. There's like 60 IOMMU groups in total between the onboard peripherals, the M.2 slots, the PCI Express by 16 slots. I did not see, there is a way to enable VROC or bifurcation for your PCIe slots. However, I used the PCIe bifurcation cable in the six, second by 16 slot, and that worked for NVMe storage devices, but didn't work for graphics cards. I don't know why. I'm Model, this is level one. I'm signing out, and I'll see you later.